Well, it's good to be back with everybody. And uh, I want to thank once again, Voice of the Wilderness, John, um, for inviting us to come and speak. I hope that the time that we spend together will be a profitable one. I can tell you this, brothers and sisters, and I, I'm sure some of you are aware of this. I hope all of you are. We are living in extraordinary times and fascinating times, especially if you're a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and especially if you, you are a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I'm going to explain why I say that, because in the times in which we are living, <clears throat> you know, each generation is given a specific message for that time. And there's not a doubt in my mind that uh, the three angels message is uh, ever so uh, uh, important uh, today than it has ever been. And it is the opportune time to actually share that uh, wonderful message with uh, this world. And, and, and uh, we have a moral uh, responsibility to do everything that we can to um, exemplify the very virtues of Jesus Christ, and more importantly, to uh, help um, those along the way who may not understand. Um, so I, I'm just very appreciative for the uh, for the privilege and the opportunity. Um, before we begin, I'm gonna have a, a word of prayer, then I'm gonna share uh, my message. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity we have to come together. What a joy it is, dear Lord, to share our faith with you and uh, those who are uh, with uh, those who are listening, and I pray you will please help me to speak the words of life. May the angels of the Lord keep watch over me, and uh, dear Lord, please bless us today on your holy Sabbath day to draw closer to you. We thank you in Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, I'm looking here at Matthew 24, and I've been sharing this really either directly or indirectly um, from the time that we've been uh, doing these meetings. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I, I, I keep thinking of this chapter, of course, by the way, Mark 24, or excuse me, uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21 are all parallel chapters. I'd recommend you go back and spend quality time in those chapters because there's no doubt that we are living in uh, in the fulfillment of uh, particular passages of of, uh, of this chapter. But if you look with me here, as Jesus um, in Matthew 24, um, you know the disciples showed Jesus. They were bragging and boasting of the, of the temple and how beautiful it was, and rightly so. It was a very beautiful building. However, uh, Jesus makes a startling statement. He denounces the city and the temple. And he says, not one stone shall be left upon another. And that's, of course, verse two. This, of course, is a statement that the disciples were not expecting. I mean, this absolutely took them by surprise. Um, it startled them to such an extent that they thought, well, then this must mean then the end of the world. We remember Jesus talking about the end of the world, so it wasn't a new subject for them. And uh, they thought, well, if, if the temple is to be destroyed in Jerusalem, well, then therefore um, uh, it must mean the end of all things. This is the time when, when Christ is going to return again. Um, now, they had a misconception of the coming of Christ. They are, and that was based on their misconception of the promises that God gave to Abraham and his descendants. They took it literal and local. Um, and that's to be understood that way at that time. What they failed to recognize is that there were conditions uh, to, that, to the covenant promises. And that's something that even today Christians fail to understand the significance of the covenant relationship that's predicated on on conditions it's is deuteronomy the book of the covenant uh i think it's 49 times the, the word if is used um, and of course that's conditional so god says i'll do this for you if you do this for me now obviously the qualifying factor of that last part if you do this for me man is incapable of doing anything 
that God requires in and of themselves. However, with the, 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 the grace of God, man is, is more than able to fulfill what God requires. So uh, the Jews had a, a, a very serious flaw in their uh, understanding of their relationship with God. They thought that they could never, never be severed, never be severed in their connection with God, that the covenant would always be, and that, um, and that, uh, uh, that if the destruction of Jerusalem were to occur, this must mean, therefore, the end of all things, the end of the world, the coming of Christ, things of this nature. So it was all stemming on the, uh, the frailty of their uh, misinterpretation of scripture, which again, you got to keep that in mind. I mean, these are the chosen people of God. They're, that's, that's the church of Jesus Christ in that day. And, and you got to understand, dear friends, these people profess to know the word of God. And yet many of them, many of them were wholly ignorant of what the word of God was saying. Even though they were reading it, they just didn't understand it. And now think about that for just a moment. Is it possible that someone could spend time reading the word of God and not know the true meaning? Is that possible? Of course it's possible. Paul says spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Without the aid of the Holy Spirit, my friends, I don't care how much time you spend reading the Bible. If unaided by the Spirit of God, you're never going to be able to discern the true intent of what it is that God is saying. In other words, you're going to be nothing but a surface reader. You're not going to be able to be angered into the deep things of God. And so Jesus goes on to tell them. And then, of course, this is when they, they, they ask him privately. Uh, Peter, James, and John pull him aside and, and say, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of our coming at the end of the world? I mean, they were startled. They were, you can read it in the, in the words. They were startled by the denunciation of Jesus Christ, what he said regarding Jerusalem. And Jesus said, the first thing many shall come, he says, Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. Deception. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, you shall deceive many. And it's interesting to note, dear friends, when you look at this, it, it, this is repeated several times. Several times it's repeated. Deception. And if it goes on in Acts 24, says, if it were possible, deceive the very elect. What I find interesting today in the light of the crisis that we've been faced with for the last year and a half, nearly two years now, is that things are starting to manifest themselves regarding the true nature, not only of, uh, of what is existing in society, but also what's happening in the church, what's taking place in the lives of individuals who claim to be Christians. I am, I am more than convinced now that we are living in a time when God is revealing things to us, he's showing us what's really going on. And there is an awakening process taking place among those who, who uh, uh, really want to know, who, who um, all, all blessings to God, who have their eyes open and ears, and ears uh, to pay attention. So you see, when we read these things, when we begin to evaluate what God says in his word, we have to realize, dear friends, that we are living in Matthew 24. We're there because he goes on to say, you'll hear of wars, rumors of wars. He says, now, don't, don't let that trouble you. He says, for all these things must come to pass. He says, but the end is not yet. It's not over yet. It's trouble. Yeah, these are troublous times, but it's not over yet. He says, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There should be famines and pestilence and earthquakes and divers places. He says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And I think that's precisely where we are. We're the beginning of sorrows. I said this to you before. I know, you know, sometimes 
people say, <laughs> I remember when I used to teach at Bible college, you know, people say to me, why do you why do you keep repeating yourself you know, in class i said well what did is it what is it that i repeated what did i say and they would say oh you said this 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 and this i said well good then you remember what i told you sometimes it's necessary to repeat a particular point in order to drive home to the people the essence of what it is that you that you want to say to them and i'm trying to tell you dear friends for the last two, nearly two years, I've been preaching on this and, and I'm begging people, hear me, hear me. Before it's too late, before it's too late, you, got, you better get your life right with God and your fellow man. You better do it now. You know, the parable of the 10 virgins, dear friends, I mean, the parable of the 10 virgins, Matthew 25, it tells you, and this, by the way, that's the next chapter, he says, you know, they all slept and then they woke up and then the five wise, they began to trim their lamps and the five foolish began to recognize I don't have enough oil to sustain myself during this crisis. And that oil represents the, the, the spirit, but it's the experience one gets by, by the Holy Spirit. In other words, developing character. Character can only be developed in the life of the individual that has an experience with the workings of God in their life. Now, again, you, it, it comes in various ways. You don't have to be a missionary. You don't have to do some extraordinary thing in order to have an experience with God. You know, just doing your daily chores from day to day, going to work and doing the various things you do. That's you can have an experience with God. You don't have to do extraordinary things to, uh, to manifest the character of God. You do it in little things every day. Are you faithful in the little things? Friends, surely you and I must realize by now, this world is not getting any better. In the 35 plus years I've been going around and sharing my faith, I'm going to tell you something right now, dear friends. I've never seen a time like this before. And in the 40 years I've been a, a Christian, I'm going to tell you this, uh, as much as, uh, uh, you know, when I started reading these things and, you know, it's hard to fathom at first, right? You kind of grips, you think, well, I just can't really grapple with this whole concept. But for the first time in my life, I can actually see how it can all unfold. In other words, the actual, the implementation of all these things. And by the way, I'm of the opinion, and I think I'm not wrong, that everything you're witnessing now that's taking place regarding COVID with the restrictions and the COVID passes, you not be able to go places, do this or do that. That's the infrastructure. It's all being laid down. It's all being laid down. And what they're doing, dear friends, through this COVID crisis is they're conditioning you with a psychological warfare to submit, yield step by step, little by little, because, dear friends, what we have here is a health crisis. Okay, this is a health crisis, and it's an issue of health now. But don't tell me it has nothing to do with worship. This is, to me, appalling when I hear people tell me oh, it has nothing to do with the, the worship. This is nothing to do. It's not religious. It has everything to do with religion, everything to do with God, everything to do with the Bible, and especially the Seventh-day Adventist message. And I'll tell you why. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe in the concept of the mind, body, and the soul, that it's one. In other words, we don't separate it. We believe that the mental, the physical, and the spiritual coexist, that, it, that one affects the other, that they all have an integral part to play. It's not one versus the other. And so it's critical. This is a health issue. It has to do with the physical, the body, which therefore then has a direct correlation to the what? My soul, my spirit. In other words, the spiritual nature of man. And therefore my conscience, my mind, must dictate what I must do. And I must let God direct me. 
and to have any agency, any agency, whether secular or religious, to impose their will upon your conscience regarding your physical being that has a direct correlation to your, to your spiritual nature is absolutely uh, unacceptable. Dear friends, listen to me. In the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, uh, the disciples were told not to mention the name of Jesus or we're going to throw you in prison if you do. It, you can't preach or we're going to throw you in prison. They were threatened by the authorities that is a direct violation of their religious convictions. And today we're told by the, by the government authorities you can't go to church unless we tell you. You can't, you can't uh, uh, preach a sermon unless we tell you. And in some places of the world, dear friends, they're arresting people who just assembled to go to church. They're arresting them. They're putting them in prison and, 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 and other places are finding them. Now, listen, let me tell you something, dear friends. You got to decide what you're going to do. Now, I can't be conscious for you and you can't be conscious for me. Everybody has to determine where they stand in regarding these issues. However, we have the testimony of the word of God. The disciples were threatened. You can't even mention the name of Jesus Christ or we're going to put you in prison. And what decision did they make? We ought to obey God rather than men. That's what they said. We're coming to a crossroads. And I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. There are, with few exceptions, I listen very carefully, the leadership of our church, with few exceptions, and this includes the pastors, have, have, uh, have, um, have been absolutely, um, well, they're missing in action, as we say. They're nowhere to be found. Where are, the, where are the shepherds of the flock? Where are they? Are they defending the, 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 the sheep? Because the wolves have come in. Where's the religious liberty department? Nowhere to be found. This is a travesty. An utter travesty. I said this to you before. Now say it again. God so arranged circumstances to allow this crisis to come. He allowed it to happen for a divine purpose. It was to give the church an opportunity to share with the world the three angels message with the entering wedge of the health message, which is the right arm of the gospel. Listen very carefully to me. We were given a golden opportunity. And instead of taking up the challenge and going forward in the name of Christ, the, many of our leaders fail to show up and give an account for the reason of the faith that lies within them. One thing is clear. God is revealing who's who. He's showing you. If you haven't realized by now, dear friends, Micah's words ever come so true. Trust ye not in a friend. Uh, put ye not confidence in a God and keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Because a man's enemy are going to be them of his own household. Jesus said there'll be five in a house, three against two and two against three. God is bringing forth a shaking in the church. And people need to wake up before it's too late. 
We've got to understand where we are. The Lord is allowing this to happen. And I thank him because he's giving us an opportunity. I don't believe this is the Sunday law. I've been making that clear from day one. However, I absolutely believe and convinced this is the setting up for the Sunday law. In other words, the infrastructure is being laid for what's coming next. And God is trying to help us to understand that, that unless we get our lives right with him, it will be too late. Now, I don't know what the outcome will be for you. I hope and pray you are found on the right side. However, if you choose to persist in disobeying the revealed will of God, and you are unwilling to change your life for whatever reason or excuses and justifications you make regarding the nature of the course of action you take, I'm telling you now you will be found sadly wanting when God takes up your name in the judgment. No amount of self-justification will excuse your behavior. Like Matthew chapter 7. Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful things in thy name? And they began to list all those things. And by the way, you know as well as I do, there's not one thing on that list that, 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 is, is, um, that they could condemn that's wrong. It's all virtuous. Everything, and by the way, everything that they said they did, they actually did it. They weren't lying. Jesus said, notice, Jesus didn't say to them, depart from me, you liars. They told the truth. They actually went and did all these things. You say, well, Brother Ray, what? I don't understand. If they were doing the, the works of God, how could they be lost? Jesus said, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. That word knew in the Greek means to have an experience with God. Remember, that goes back to the parable of the ten virgins. What were they lacking? They lacked an experience. They at one time had an experience, but they didn't continue their experience. It's not enough regarding what, oh, this is what I've done in the past. Okay, and that's beautiful, wonderful, but that's, that's not enough. What are you doing today? And he said, well, brother, I can't travel. I can't do that. I, again, I, I clarify you don't have to do miraculous, you know, the extraordinary things. You don't have to do that. You know, just doing simple tasks, being faithful in regard to the simple things of life is a miraculous manifestation of the will of God. We just don't seem to recognize it. We seem to think that unless the walls of Jericho, or Jericho fall, uh, that no miracle has occurred. The fact that you're faithful, kind, gentle, sweet, loving, manifesting the, 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 the fruits of the spirit in your life in daily chores. That, dear friends, is equivalent to the walls of Jericho falling or the departing of the Red Sea. Because it's the manifestation of the presence of God in your life. He's working through you, giving you an experience. And, and the Lord is trying to help us to understand time is running out. Now, I've said this before. It may well be, and hopefully I pray to God it shall be, that God will grant us a reprieve. I really do. Matter of fact, we're told in the spirit of prophecy, I think four or five times uh, when I've been preaching these messages to you, I've mentioned uh, quotations uh, four or five times, how we're told that we should pray that God give us uh, a reprieve, that, that he would delay, in order that we may take advantage of the opportunity of that delay to uh, prepare ourselves. And our friends, I would tell you, uh, there's a lot of people, frankly, all of us, but I mean, more so in some cases, they better pray to God there is a delay.
Because I can tell you this, dear friends, that um, it's not going to matter. Um, you know, as I said, you know, how many wonderful things you've done for God if you don't continue to do those things. You know, I was thinking of Eli <clears throat> the other day. And, uh, you know, it's fascinating about the life of that man. Um, <clears throat> he was uh, considered a man of God. And we're told in the spirit of prophecy, very interesting, if you carefully study the scriptures and, and in conjunction with the spirit of prophecy regarding these things. Now, he was a man of God, a God claim, and this is the, the, the claim that was made regarding him. And it's, it's fascinating that he was also a man of prayer. And he was a, actually a, a man that uh, was a very kind man, a very, a very wonderful person. Actually, you would like to be around him. That's the kind of personality he had. He was a very loving, lovable person. Um, but what's interesting about Eli, or um, yes, uh, is that um, even though he was a man of prayer, he was not a man that acted on his prayer. In other words, dear friends, he wasn't a doer of the word of God when God needed him the most. In other words, dear friends, we find in Eli a time server. He served God only when it was convenient. And when it came to the issues of dealing with certain particular things that God needed him to act on, he refused to do so. And I'm sorry to say, but friends, Eli is going to miss out on heaven. So is it possible that you can also be a person of prayer? And be a nice, wonderful, loving, lovable, kind person and yet miss out on heaven? Yes. Why? It's not enough to be a hearer of the word. You've got to be a doer of the word as well. It's not that your faith, listen very carefully now, it's not that your faith rests on your works to justify you. No. Your faith rests on the promises of God to fulfill what God requires through you and in you. In other words, dear friends, look, we don't rely on our works as a means to save us. Rather, we rely on the merits of Jesus Christ through faith in the promises of God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and that save us. So I lean wholly upon Christ. It's only Christ, only his word, only his grace, only faith in Christ is going to save you. But if you don't act on the word of God, then there's no hope for you. You see, dear friends, uh, there's two things. One is that this, in, in steps to Christ, you know, many people, she says, desire to be Christians, but they fail to become Christians because they fail to choose to become Christians. Many people desire heaven, but that doesn't mean they're going to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, then you need to choose to de be determined to choose to go to heaven. Not in your strength, but in the strength of the only one that can take us there, Jesus Christ. And so uh, it, it, you gotta remember those things. It's not enough to pray. You've got to act. You've got to move uh, forward in Jesus Christ, relying wholly on his grace alone as the means by which you can achieve these, uh, these things that God requires of you. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Love is manifested not so much in the words that you express, but rather, dear friends, in the deeds that you perform. And I'm convinced today God is helping us to see whether or not we really love him. And I'm sorry to tell you, but I think a lot of people, if they're honest with themselves, realize they've fallen short of that. And so you got to ask yourself, friends, where do you stand today? Where do you stand? Where are you in relation to this issue? What have you been doing for the Lord? And I tell you this, you know. <clears throat> If you've been paying attention to what's been happening around the world, I'm sure some of you are, you, can, you know that the, this crisis is global, and in some places it's worse than others. 
Um, our brothers and sisters in Christ, some of them there are suffering big time right now. And I'm not saying they haven't been before that time, but this crisis has brought out an evil spirit in the hearts of many of those who are in government. It is, it is without a doubt manifesting the presence of Satan. Anytime you coerce somebody to do something against their will, and I don't even care if you're right. For example, let me give you an example. Friends, do you know that if the government were to legislate Sabbath laws, the keeping of the Seventh-day Sabbath, and force people to do it, we would have to oppose it. You know that, right? You're aware of that? And it's not because we oppose the Seventh-day Sabbath. It's because we oppose the coercion of the will, the conscience. I told you about this before. Uh, well, maybe not you. Maybe it was another group. <laughs> I've been preaching. Um, thank God for Zoom. I praise the Lord for the opportunity to speak, even though I can't be present physically there. Uh, however. Um, you know, um, um, when you see what's been taking place around this world, um, regarding the, uh, the circumstances of certain people, it, 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 uh, brings an awareness to your mind, at least it should, you know, some of our people, as I said, are really hurting. And, uh, and so you got to ask yourself. You know, where, where do, uh, what can I do? What can, you know, is there anything that I can do? Well, one thing I can tell you, we need to be doing more than we've ever been doing before. And we need to be praying for one another. We really do. We need to be praying for one another. And especially people in Australia, those, those, my brothers and sisters over there, I got to do meetings actually, and I think next week or the week, the week later, I don't remember when exactly, but a couple of weeks from now, I'll be preaching a Zoom meeting in, to my brothers and sisters in Australia. And, um, and I want to tell you, dear friends, they're getting hit real hard, real hard. So um, uh, it, it is a, it is unbelievable. Unbelievable. They will not let you go to church in Australia. And this is true in some other parts of the countries uh, uh, of the world. However, uh, they won't let you go to church at all unless you're vaccinated twice. You got to be vaccinated twice. They won't let you go to church. Now, see, I'm sorry, but, you know, there comes a point you're going to have to pay a price to be a disciple. Jesus said, or it was Paul who said, excuse me, but of course, words of, of, of our blessed uh, God and Savior. But Paul said in Timothy, he said, you know, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall, not maybe or could be, shall suffer persecution. Persecution is inevitable for those who walk the path of, uh, of, of the Christian life. But already people are being persecuted. The persecution has begun, dear friends. I, I'm amazed some people can't even fathom that concept. And I'm going to explain something to you why it's important to understand that. Because there are three phases to the shaking. Listen very carefully to me. First is heresy. Second is the straight testament. The third is persecution. And what you've got to understand, that is during the third phase of the persecution, that Jesus' ministry ceases to exist in the, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Persecution is already going on, which means we're in the third phase of the shaking, which means we're nearing the close of human probation. How many of you remember the story of in early writings of those who lost sight of Jesus in the work of God in the ministration of the spirit in the sanctuary above? What happened to them, dear friends? They were left behind. Why? Because they lost sight of Jesus. And he says, they imbibed another spirit, thinking it was the spirit of God, but it wasn't the spirit of God. It was the spirit of Satan. And remember what Jesus taught, the man who was cleansed. The soul temple was cleansed. Remember what happened? He didn't continue. He went back. What happened? 
He says they swept it clean. And what happened? And seven more demons came in and occupied it. Why? Because he didn't listen. It's not enough to cleanse the soul temple. You got, Jesus has to abide. If he doesn't abide in your life, guess who will? Somebody's going to abide in you. It's either God or Satan. And, and so you uh, I have to realize, dear friends, we're in the third phase of the shaking. It's already begun. The church of Jesus Christ is being persecuted. Now, not over the Sabbath issue. No, not over the Sabbath issue, but over the health issue. And don't tell me the health message isn't a critical part of the three angels message. It is. If to those who study out this message, they know that the health message is a vital connection to the three angels message. I told you, we believe in the three uh, or, or tier concept of, of, of the spiritual man, the whole, the mental, the mind, the physical, the body, right? And then the spiritual. We believe that. That's why this issue is critical. See, this really isn't about the vaccines in one aspect. And the one it is, I mean, in terms of whether they're healthy or not, I don't believe they are at all. I mean, all the research I've done, uh, I don't think the vaccines are healthy at all. All right, so that's one issue. Uh, but, the, but the driving force is the conscience, the issue of conscience. There are some people, they don't even care if the vaccines are safe or not. They, but they believe that for conscience sake, they don't want to do it. So whether you believe it or not or accept it or not doesn't matter. In other words, regarding the nature of the safety of the vaccines. These people believe it's a violation of their conscience. And remember what Paul says in Romans 14. Romans 14 is all about the, the, the issue of conscience. Some person thinks that if you, uh, you know, he doesn't want to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Now, it doesn't bother me. Paul's saying, look, you've got to be sensitive to the, to the, to the, uh, issue, of the, the issue of conscience regarding the nature of those who, who, who uh, feel otherwise. In other words, Paul's whole argument in Romans 14 is about re respecting the issue of liberty of conscience. You know, I've heard some people say, well, liberty of conscience only applies when it's a religious issue. No, it's no, it doesn't. It's the exercise of your conscience regarding the nature of what you believe to be right or wrong, regardless of the issue. If you believe something to be wrong and conscientiously you can't do it for whatever reason, even if you're wrong, it doesn't matter. It's your it's the issue of conscience. And who are we to force your conscience? We have no right, and neither does the government. And so we are confronted with extraordinary uh, times. We really are. And we're in the third phase of the shaking. It's commenced. Clearly indicating, dear friends, we are reaching the end of time. And if you go to Matthew 24, what's interesting as I said to you before, in verse 8 says, all, all these are the beginning of sorrows. This is the beginning. I mean, that, that statement, if it, it's, that's not a, it, it, it's not a comforting statement. I'll be honest with you. This is the beginning. I'd hate to see what's coming next. And then he tells you what's coming next. He says, then, that's after this will take place. He says, then this is going to happen. Okay. <clears throat> he says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my namesake. And then shall many be offended and, and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And I love verse 13. Or yeah, for thir verse 13. Listen, please drive this one home. He says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Perseverance, you can't give up. 
The next phase of the crisis is when the heat really turns up. He says, what's interesting, because if you read it very carefully, it's not, there's no allusion to it. It's not like I, I can't figure it out. No, he says, um, uh, uh, he says, many shall be afflicted and shall, and shall kill you. So we're going to see the death of the saints. That's the next phase. You realize what's coming, friends? Are you prepared? See, this is why you better get your act together now. See, I can fool you and you can fool me, but I'm telling you now, we're never going to fool the Almighty. That's not going to happen. You and I better take a good, long, careful look at your life and you better analyze it. My, what, what does Paul say? Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. That word examine is a very interesting word in the Greek. It means to examine the minutiae of your life. But if you're not honest with yourself, no matter how much reflection you may make, it's not going to help you. It's not an easy thing or a pleasant thing to look at your life as you really are. Because you see yourself in ways you find very uncomfortable. That you're really not so nice as you like to think you are. That you're not so kind as you like to think you are that you really aren't as loving as you think you are. That you're really not a Christian as much as you think you are. You begin to realize, not only have I fallen short of God's glory, but I am wholly unprepared for what's coming. Jesus has warned us. He's told us these words. I speak to you today. They're 2000 years old. Are we hearing the words of God? You know, Jesus said they have ears to hear, but they cannot hear. They've got eyes to see, but they cannot see. It's not that you can't hear. It's not that you can't see. In some cases, you don't want to see. You don't want to hear. Friends, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And this is the, and, and the, of course, the verse 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. Then you find verse 15, the Sunday law. And the universal con uh, uh, Sunday law and the market of beast, all of these issues are unrolling. But this is serious persecution time in the next phase. And of course, verse 14, the proclamation of the three angels message, that's the latter rain. And you understand that the latter rain is not the time to get your character right. Latter rain has nothing to do with you overcoming your sins. It's only those who have overcome their sins who will be recipients of the latter rain, which means now is the time to get your life right. And by the way, just a footnote, it's during the phase of the, the third phase of the shaking, the persecution. That's when the latter rain begins to fall. So that tells me we're not far from the latter rain falling. So what again, whatever defects you might possess, you better get it. Right, right with the Lord now. You got to make something right with a brother and a sister in the Lord. You better go do it. Apologize. Whatever you have to do to rectify the problem, rectify it. I don't care how much humble pie you have to eat. You know, as they say, I, I got to eat some crow today. Well, let me tell you something. You may have to eat crow for quite a while. So what? Better to eat crow now than, the, than to eat the damnation of God. I'd rather, I mean, you know, it's, it's humiliating. Yes. Embarrassing. Yes. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's, but that's the way it goes. So persevere, toughen up. And don't make justification or excuses for your actions. Admit wholly what you've done and, and then plead for mercy 
again, uh, towards the one that you've transgressed. However, if that individual chooses not to forgive you, that's on them, right? You've done your part. That's all you need to worry about. Their part, that's between them and God. Now, hopefully they will accept your, your, uh, your forgiveness or your, um, your um, uh, asking them to forgive you. Um, but nonetheless, you, you've, we have to understand how important it is, dear friends, how important it is regarding what's been taking place and in relation to Matthew 24. You know, Daniel and Revelation, we were talking about this evening. It was brought out last night, even again, um, in the meetings uh, that we were watching um, last night on, on um, the health message and uh, other issues that were taking place regarding um, God's church around the world. <clears throat> and it's true, you know, that when you look at the book of Daniel, and it's very it's fascinating. Now, the book of Daniel is only 12 chapters, small book. And and uh, but fundamentally, half the book is historical. The other half is prophetic. Now, Daniel 2 is both a historical event with a prophecy in it. But Daniel 1, Daniel uh, 3, 4, and 5, and 6 are all historical events. But, uh, but what is interesting, what's fascinating about it is that they are um, historical events that describe uh, in a in a, uh, a, a typical fashion and a typology as it were how it, uh, it, uh, regarding what will be at the end of time in other words eat you can extract principles for example in daniel one the health message right you can extract that out for the last days no man can buy or sell well that has to do with your health right obviously and that's not, that's not food because already they're mandating in certain parts of the country and even in the United States of America, in certain parts of the states, that unless you're vaccinated, you can't, you can't get medical attention. I don't care how critical of a condition you're in. In some parts, uh, 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 they won't, uh, they won't uh, uh, take care of you, which is unbelievable. But in Australia, they are cutting you off completely from any medical attention unless you're vaccinated. This is where they're going at, right? This is insane. So Daniel 1, we can extract the health principles. And then what do you have in Daniel 3? Well, you have the, uh, uh, the, 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 the golden image being set up, right? You got the golden image being set up. So you can see the health message tied in to the image of the beast. In other words, how important it is. Then, then you go to Daniel 4. Well, what's Daniel 4 about? Well, let's think about it. It's the, it's the fall of Nebuchadnezzar and pride. And God is reminding you and me, listen, in this crisis, you better remain humble or you will fall. Daniel 5, what's that? That's Belshazzar's feast, the handwriting on the wall. The close of human probation. The coming of, 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 of Cyrus. Who is a type of who? Jesus Christ. The drying up of the river Euphrates. Friends, that's the sixth plague. So Daniel 5 is a classic, classic example of the end of the world. Daniel chapter 6, what do you got? Daniel and the lion's den. Parallels Daniel 3. What I'm trying to tell some of you, and please hear me, is that we're about to enter the fiery furnace. We're about to go into the lion's den. You know, we're told that when Nebuchadnezzar, uh, during in Daniel chapter 3, um, before everyone bowed the knee, the music was to be played. And we were told that... Um, there were many Jews there, many, many Jews, God's people. And what's interesting, only three refused to bow the knee. Now, Daniel wasn't present there, but Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, they were there. And everybody bowed, everybody, except three people. You know, I'm telling you something, dear friends, <clears throat> call me crazy, I don't care. But I believe the 144,000 is a literal number. You got 
tens of thousands of God's people standing in the, in the, the, the plain of Dura, and, not, and only three of them stand? Only three? Jesus said, are there few that be saved? You know, that's a rhetorical question. Of course, the answer is, that's right. Yes, he didn't need a response to that. The answer is, yes, that's right. Only a few will be saved in comparison to the, to the world at large. Only a few. That's why Jesus said, Matthew 24, and he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. It's about endurance, not giving up. It's about holding on, persevering. Hananiah, Mishan, and Zariah were faithful to Jesus Christ prior to the crisis in the little things that they did so that when the great crisis came, they didn't have to uh, take into consideration what their choice would be. They automatically did it. And as I said to Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful concerning these things. In other words, we, we don't have to think it through. We already know what our decision is. And you can do whatever you want, king. You can persecute us. You can kill us. You can do whatever. We're not going to yield to your mandates. We're not surrendering. And dear friends, that's where we're headed. And what we're witnessing today is the groundwork, the infrastructure. Think about this in Daniel 3. You think they set that image up immediately? It took time to make that image. It took time. Which means, dear friends, people like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, having been high-ranking government officials, would have realized at some point in time, hey, we got something going on here that isn't good. It's a foreboding sign. Something is bad right around the corner. Which would tell me, because they love God, that means they would warn their brothers and sisters in Jesus. That would be the right thing to do. So these people weren't caught off guard. Dear friends, listen, Jesus is coming. And we better come to grips with where we are at this time. Jesus said, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. You may say, oh, Ray, I've, I've let God down miserably. I've been another failure. Now, listen to me. I've been saying this time and time again. It may well be that you've fallen short of God's glory, but listen to me. I don't want you to focus on the wrong. I want you to focus on Jesus because he's going to make the wrong right. But you got to persevere. At some point, dear friends, listen to me. We got to stop stumbling and falling. At some point in time, I'm sorry. We've got to stop making excuses for stumbling and falling all the time. At some point, there has to be victory. And I'm uh, uh, telling you, this is the day. This is the day. This is the moment. Now, I, I forgot to set my time, so I'm not even sure how long I've been going. Okay, well, I better have to close up. Um, let me just, uh, let me uh, uh, wrap it up here very quickly. Um, I don't know what it is that God has to do to show us that he cares for us that he loves us, and that he wants us ready for the kingdom of heaven. I mean, I don't know what's taking place in your life personally. However, I know that God loves you, and that he's trying to do everything he can to get you to surrender. You know, human beings, we are we are stubborn people. We just don't want to let go and let God take control. We are so um, unwilling. But at some point, dear friends, you and I are going to have to let go of this world. And we've got to let go of our sins. And we've got to let God take over. Which means 
We're going to have to learn to live by faith only. You understand? We're going to have to live by faith alone. Trusting wholly in the merits of Jesus Christ. Being completely dependent upon him to do for us what we are incapable of doing for ourselves. You know, I think if you're honest with yourself, you will admit that every time you've taken over your life, you've, you've caused it, it, uh, a, a disaster. You've caused a disaster in your own life. You know, God didn't cause the disaster. You did. That's because you, you, you took the reins out of his hands. And God is trying to help you and I to understand, dear friends. He wants to take over. He wants to gain, gain complete control of your life. Jesus Christ is coming. And my prayer is, dear friends, that we would wake up, wake up before it's too late. Now, <clears throat> before I close, I want to say something. I want to, to those of you who've been praying for Judy and I and the work that we've been doing, I thank you very much. I really do. Prayer is the most important thing, more than anything that you can imagine. And I, uh, I want to thank you for your prayers. Uh, I want to thank you for those who have been supporting our work throughout the years. You know who you are, and I thank you on, on behalf of Judy and I. And I want to say that, of course, I give God the glory. All blessings to the Lord Almighty. I know that ultimately in the end, it's, the, it's God provides for all our needs. However, uh, I, I am appealing to you to realize um, that we each have a work to do. Each of us has a, a call to do whatever task that God lays upon us. But dear friends, um, uh, from the bottom of our hearts, we want, Judy and I want to thank you. And please continue to keep us in your prayers as we shall do for you. Um, uh, I just, um, uh, I just uh, am so blessed uh, to be in this capacity. And I know much will be required of me at the hands of God on the day uh, uh, of accountability. I only pray that the Lord uh, will uh, pronounce upon me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Um, I just want to say that um, we need to encourage one another. We need to really get together. If you can't meet in church, meet in the homes. I don't care how you fellowship. You must have fellowship. Do not forsake the fellowshipping of one another. Listen to me. I don't care what the government requires. Okay, please hear me. We must meet together somehow, some way. The apostolic church began in the home churches. And I got a funny feeling that's where it's going to end. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, keep pressing forward. If you can't meet in the, in the, in the, uh, the churches, your assigned churches that you go to normally, that for whatever reason, um, then you must meet together somehow, somewhere, and, and continue the worship of God. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over for a few comments by John. So let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we thank you. We praise you for your kindness and your mercy. We give you all the honor and glory. We know that you have been kind to us and helping us and blessing us. We know that you have uh, taught us from time to time really what it means to walk with you humbly. And I pray, Lord, that you give us the grace and strength, the faith to persevere to the very end. Forgive us where we've let you down. Oh, Lord, like Jeremiah of old, put a fire in our bones so much so that we could never keep quiet about your loving uh, grace and, and character. And so bless us now, we pray. May your angels watch over us and protect us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, just before I turn over to John, I want to just say, uh, if you'd like, some of you do already know, but if you want to visit our, uh, our website, emi-ministries.org, emi-ministries.org, um, 
So I just uh, just drop a line there. All right, John, our brother John, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Elder Ray. I'd like to thank Elder Ray Di Carlo for the first meeting that he's shared with us this afternoon. And I pray that we would take note of the message that's been given to us today by the Lord's manservant. It's Sodom. It's truth. And it's what I believe we need to hear in order for us to be serious and for us to, at this time, understand what God requires of us in order for us to be saved at this time. And our next meeting will be at six o'clock this evening. Please join us for part eight. And I do pray that in the time in between this meeting and the next meeting, that we'll take time to reflect upon the message that God's given to us. Amen. So I'd like to thank Elder Ray Carlo for the meeting and look forward to you all joining us at 6 p.m. later on. So thank you. May God bless you and keep you. Amen.